it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. The witching hour is almost upon us, so why not join me around the campfire? I've got a couple of stories to tell you, and there goes something like this. The Hedge Witch of Harrowick Woods My name's Charlotte, but I usually go by Lottie, since my last name's Webb. I'm not embarrassed about it though, I actually love spiders. I wear spider jewelry and I even have a few spider tattoos, but I like to minimize people commenting on my name as much as I can. Sometimes a name can tell you a lot about a person, but sometimes they can be misleading. For instance, I have, for uh, financial reasons, recently moved in with my childhood friend, Alice Faircroft. Now, based on nothing more than her name, where would you assume Miss Alice Faircroft lives? Somewhere fancy, right? An old British manor house, maybe. Alas, the Faircroft estate is naught but a single white trailer in the Somber Creek trailer park. Uh, to be fair, it's a nice trailer park. There's a perimeter of trees all around it. Also trees inside. Park centred around the eponymous Somber Creek. And it's right beside a motel with a gas station and a diner. Alice has lived there with her mother her whole life. And for the past couple of years or so, I think with her boyfriend, Jack Ashbourne. Since the trailer only has two bedrooms, I sleep on a couch, or the couch, since it's the only one, which is in the living room. Despite this couch being only 20 feet away from two horny 20-somethings who bang every chance they get, and surrounded by neighbours that don't strictly abide by the park's no loud noise after 9pm rule, I never had any difficulty sleeping there until last night. I think it was around 3am, and I was awoken by what sounded like a cross between a roar and a howl from the woods across the highway. Coyotes and the neighbor's dogs are the only things that howl around here, and this sounded nothing like either of those. It sounded almost like a person, only feral and crazed. But that wasn't the weirdest thing about it, though. Oh, the really weird thing, the thing that really freaked me out, was that it triggered my synesthesia gave me these images of a maiden goddess in a sacred grove, of a witch's sabbath, of a portal to the underworld. I've had synesthesia my whole life, or at least I thought I did, but I've never experienced anything like that before. I thought that maybe the fact that I was still half asleep and that the sound was so strange was what had caused the intense vision. But the experience really left me rattled, and I wasn't able to get any more sleep that night. The next day, Jack, Alice, and I were sitting around outside their trailer, drinking some local craft beer that had been part of Jack's payment for his last gig. Jack's a very, very minor local celebrity, and when we're not under lockdown, he plays a few sets a week at various dives around the county. I think he also has an album on Spotify, maybe a channel on YouTube or something. Even though I'm pretty sure he only makes enough money to pay for his Mustang, Alice and her mum treat him like a rock star and seem convinced it's only a matter of time before they're rich. It also doesn't hurt that he's insanely hot and perpetually shirtless, so I guess it's not that weird that they don't mind putting him up. And, well, he's more successful than I am at any rate, so I'm in no position to judge. Uh, hey, how either you two hear that fucked up howling coming from the woods last night? I asked, staring off warily in the direction of the forest. Howling? Sorry, no, I didn't hear anything, Alice said. Probably just those coyotes, though. It's springtime, so the boys are fighting over girls, and the girls are getting a much-needed pounding. <sighs> it definitely wasn't coyotes. Not even coyotes having sex, I insisted. The strange vision the sound had given me was still fresh in my mind, and was thankfully keeping me from visualizing a coyote orgy. I think it was a person... Like someone doing some kind of shamanic ritual or something. I don't know, but it kind of freaked me out. Yeah, but what you heard was the green man, Jack claimed, gesturing with his beer can, exactly as you would expect of someone about to start rambling bullshit. Yeah, he's a primeval nature spirit who was first summoned by a settler witch centuries ago to protect these woods. 
He's the main reason Hyrick Woods is so weird to begin with. He's probably gone to town on some poachers or something. Jack, babe, don't tell us stories about the woods. She has to live here now, Alice reminded him. Oh, they're not just stories, though. There's a real hedge witch leaving in those woods. We've both seen her, he claimed. A witch? I asked, wondering if there might have been any connection to the witch's Sabbath from my vision. Ah, don't listen to him. She's not a witch, she assured me. Well, we go walking on the trail sometimes, and once we cross paths with a woman with a cloak and witchy-looking walking stick. Well, that's it. <laughs> She's not a witch. Just one of those hippie chicks that hangs out at the New Age place in town. Uh, she's definitely not living out there. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Well, we're not the only ones to have seen her, though, Jack insisted. She's a regular on the trails, and some other regulars have seen her do weird stuff, like tracing out the sigils on the trees, hanging charms off the branches, or wandering off the trail and just never coming back. A group of dude bros from Avalon College were hiking, and one of them cat called her. All she did was tap her staff to the ground and some invisible poltergeist came out of nowhere and drove them all out, screaming like toddlers. Yeah, she can summon and command the dead. Taught animals, so she definitely has a hovel deep in those woods somewhere. Some real Blair Witch shit. Lottie, I've been living across from those woods my entire life. <laughs> There's no green men, no ghosts, no witches in them, Alice swore rolling her eyes at Jack's juvenile attempt to scare me. Well, then, can we go hiking there today? I asked, hopefully. I knew it was kind of silly, that any similarities between my vision and local folklore were probably just a coincidence, and I figured it'd be healthier than sitting around drinking beer all day. Oh my god, yes. We haven't been out there since last fall. Alice agreed excitedly, pulling out her phone. Let me just check to see if the trails are open during the lockdown. We'll go. As fate would have it, the trails were open. I didn't have any hiking boots, but Alice insisted I take hers, saying that she could just piggyback on Jack anywhere there was rough terrain. She quickly threw together a backpack, grabbed three walking sticks from the shed that had been hand-carved by one of her neighbors, and we were off. Well, it only took us a few minutes to walk to the woods themselves, in a few more minutes, walking along its edge until we came to the first trail entrance, each of us putting a toonie in the donation box as we passed by. As soon as we were in, I was immediately struck by the overall atmosphere of the forest. Maybe it was just because there was so little traffic on the highway because of the lockdown, but even just a little way in, we couldn't hear anything of the outside world. I almost felt like the forest was just a little out of sync with the rest of reality. That it was older and more primeval. A place where humanity was at the mercy of nature and her servants. The hundred foot tall, centuries old trees towering over us certainly left me with the impression that we were under the watchful eye of mighty titans who wouldn't hesitate to punish any irreverence. Those woods are so much prettier in the fall. Some of the leaves are starting to bud, so that's kind of cute, Alice remarked casually, apparently not sharing my sense of existential awe. How big is this forest? I asked, already losing all sense of direction and scale. Oh, only about four square miles, or ten square kilometers, Alice replied, hopping onto Jack's shoulders. Some of the trails are really winding, though. I think there's something like forty miles of them. So they make the whole place seem ten times bigger. Well, that's why they tell beginners to stay off the deep trails. But you're with us, so it's cool. Yeah, I said, hesitantly. So aside from that witch, have you guys ever seen anything weird in here? She wasn't a witch, Alice insisted. And no, there's no big predators here, so people just make up monsters to fill the voids. Ah, oh, we found giant deer tracks once. Probably from the green man, Jack claimed. Yeah, like you know how to read tracks. They could have been anything. Alice rolled her eyes. What about that mothman lady looking thing that was perched up in that tree one time? He asked. Yeah, we both saw her. Yeah, but neither of us got a good look at it, she retorted. Though sounding a little less certain than before. 
It was just a big bird in poor lighting. Okay, well, what about that weird rune thing that were on a lot of the trees? Like that one over there, he said, pointing over at a tree a little up ahead. I peered forward and saw that he was right. The tree had some form of magical sigil carved deep into its bark. And once I noticed it, I realized that it wasn't the only one. Trees all along the trail had similar markings, and now that I'd seen them, they caused the same sort of mental feelings and imagery in my mind that the howling had. Uh, it's local tradition. Instead of hearts and initials, people around here carve those things into trees. Well, don't ask me how I got started. There's nothing to worry about. Alice tried to reassure me. I nodded acquiescently didn't say anything about all the strange vibes I was getting from the forest. We wandered the trails for another hour or so, eventually winding up somewhere pretty close to the middle of the forest. All the weird sensations and imagery the woods were giving me hadn't gone away, but they hadn't gone any worse either, so I was starting to accept that it was all just a new manifestation of my synesthesia. Jack! Jack, look! Alice shouted excitedly, still riding his shoulders without a complaint from him the whole time. I followed her finger to where she was pointing, but couldn't see what was getting her so worked up. She finally dismounted her boyfriend, grabbing him by the hand and dragging him off the trail, leaving me to chase after them if I didn't want to get left behind. We were forty or fifty feet deep when Alice came to an abrupt halt in front of a small circle, a circle of periwinkle mushrooms about seven feet across. Yeah, first shrooms of the seasons, she cheered as she knelt down, plucked off a cap and popped it right in her mouth. Wait, shrooms, you're getting high now in the middle of the forest? I demanded indignantly. Ah, no worries, laddie, we've done it before, Jack said as he sat down and took a cap for himself. Trip walking through this place is really cool. Yeah, and these shrooms only grow wild in Harrowick County for some reason. You can't cultivate them and they won't grow anywhere else. Oh, you've got to try some, she insisted, handing me a cap. I sighed, accepting the offering but putting it in my pocket. Thank you. I'm not getting high on shrooms. I've never tried before when I'm out in the middle of a goddamn forest, I affirmed, stomping my foot a little. Can we please go back on the trail? Please? This is starting to freak me out a little. Well, actually, Jack and I kind of have a tradition of fucking in the fairy ring while we're waiting for the shrooms to kick in, she admitted with a sheepish giggle. Oh, you've got to be kidding me, I said, as I felt my face contort into a rictus of horror. Sorry, laddie. She apologized while eagerly unbuckling Jack's jeans. You don't have to watch if you don't want to, though. Just go back on the trail and take a break on the first bench you find. We'll catch up, I promise. I sighed in frustration, but I didn't bother arguing with them. I knew that trying to talk them out of screwing was fruitless, so I stomped off back towards the trail. I'd almost made it, too, before I heard screaming. It wasn't real screaming, just in my head, but I could still tell that it was coming from behind me. It was faint, distant, and most of all, pleading. Whoever was screaming had heard us, or at least sensed our presence, and was calling for help. I did briefly consider that I'd somehow accidentally ingested some of the psilocybin from the mushrooms, but the scream was the same kind of sensory association that I'd been getting from the forest the entire time I'd been inside of it, so I knew I wasn't tripping. Now, I'll admit that running off into the forest chasing phantom screams wasn't the smartest thing I ever did. At the very least, I should have gotten Jack and Alice to come with me. But the screams were just so desperate that they demanded immediate action, and I didn't have the fortitude to resist the impulse to answer them. Even though I was sure I was running towards the source of the screams, they weren't getting any louder. But because I knew the sound was in my head, I didn't really question that. I must have been over 200 meters from the trail when I finally came across something that made me stop. Standing in the middle of the forest was a pair of cobblestone pillars with a metal arch over them, bearing the word, Cemetery. 
That was weird enough in and of itself. But what was even stranger was the imagery the gate was giving me. In my mind, I saw it was a set of onyx pillars, taller than any of the surrounding trees, carved with starving, virtually mummified figures in abject misery. Instead of a metal arch, the pillars supported statues of an enthroned king and queen, which I automatically interpreted as Hades and Persephone, without anything actually making that explicit. The gate itself was a thick, glowing fog, radiating out a sense of such hopelessness and terror that I was paralyzed, unable to move towards or away from it. The screaming continued, now clearly coming from the gate itself. As desperate as they were, they weren't enough to rouse me from my catatonic trance. Without warning, a black silhouette passed in front of the gate, casting a long shadow that fell upon me that seemed to eclipse all other light. The figure looked like some kind of demon woman, a pair of bat-like wings slowly flexing behind her, and I was immediately reminded of Jack's claims of having seen a winged female figure. I've never been more afraid than I was at that moment. That demon was the most literal monster I'd ever encountered. I had no idea what she meant to do with me. I quivered, whimpered, but I couldn't bring myself to fight or flee, not even when she started to move towards me. It was then that I heard a woman shouting, though I was far too frightened and fixated on the demon to catch what she was saying. The cloaked form suddenly interjected itself between me and the gateway, holding up a staff and shouting incomprehensible incantations at the demon. The demon recoiled slightly, pausing as if to consider if it was worth a fight. Apparently, I wasn't, and with a slight sneer she retreated from view. The sound of screaming left my mind, along with the image of the gateway, leaving only the out-of-place cemetery gate in its place. The cloaked figure spun to face me, and I saw a fair-skinned woman with warm brown eyes and long, beautiful red hair. Her staff was carved with the same sigils that I'd seen on the trees, topped with a crescent moon and crystal chain and a pentagram talisman hung prominently from around her neck. She was, beyond any doubt, the hedge witch that Jack and Alice and others had seen, and I had just watched her vanquish some kind of demonic hellspawn with nothing more than a glammed-out walking stick. I then, perhaps understandably, fainted. When I awoke, I was lying upon a lawn chair near the back end of a small cemetery, with the woman sitting beside me and looking down at me with a mix of concern and joyful curiosity. Are you all right? she asked, offering me a cup of water. Where are we? How long was I out? I asked as I bolted upright, looking around the cemetery in confusion. Ah, oh, barely a minute. Not even a hundred feet from the archway. You're still in Harrowig Woods, she assured me. I opened my mouth to object, but I caught myself. I was still getting the same eerie vibes from the cemetery that I had from the rest of the forest. If anything, they were stronger here. Well, the archway I saw, I saw some kind of demon woman in it. I muttered as I blushed from embarrassment, the sentence sounding ridiculous as it left my lips. She was Erinius, a fury, she nodded. The archway is a spirit portal to the astral plane, specifically the underworld, and she was trying to lure you to her. They can only cross over to our world at certain times, or if they're summoned. You must be a very powerful clairvoyant to have seen the portal's astral form. When I first found it, I could only sense its catonic nature, not see it. Uh, what? I asked dumbly. I'm not... Can you see him? She cut me off, pointing towards a man with a long coat and a stern gaze, keeping a close eye on me from a respectful distance. He was also, well, couldn't help but notice, translucent with a pale blue tinge to him. Jesus Christ, is that a ghost? He's my spirit familiar, yes, and he's not physically projecting himself right now, so you are definitely clairvoyant, 
She grinned. This cemetery was hallowed centuries ago, so that most people can't perceive it, or if they do, they can't remember it. I have a feeling you'll remember it, though. I'm Samantha, by the way, and my familiar's name is Elon. A long-haired brown tabby suddenly leapt into her lap, meowing as if she'd just said something gravely offensive. I'm sorry, my spirit's familiar's name is Elam. This is my animal familiar, Moxley, she said as she scratched him on the head. He plopped down and started purring, seemingly appeased for the moment. And what's your name, sister? Well, well um, Charlotte, Lottie, if you like. I stammered, still looking around the cemetery in confusion. I only then noticed that we were right outside a camping trailer with an enclosed awning, solar powers along the roof, and an expansive garden and homemade greenhouse. Oh my god, you live here? You, you actually live here? Absolutely. I love it out here. It's quiet, beautiful, and full of magic. She smiled. Isn't that what brought you out here? I think so, I answered pathetically. I heard someone howling out here last night and it gave me this vision like nothing I've ever experienced before. I came here to see if it meant anything. And ever since I stepped foot in here, I've been getting these powerful spiritual vibes. Oh, it wasn't you howling, was it? Not unless I howled in my sleep, she smirked. These woods are under the protection of a spirit most people call the Green Man, and I suppose he's technically my landlord. If the Howling gave you visions, then I'd say that it was him calling out to you. He probably sensed your presence and thought it'd be a good idea to send you in my direction. Yeah, my um friend's boyfriend Jack said it was the Green Man, but it's nice to get a second um, expert opinion, I said. Jack... Jack Ashbourne, she said with a raised eyebrow. Shirtless guy, thinks he's a rock star. Drives a Mustang with tasteless nudes painted on it. Uh, yes to one and two, but I kind of like the artwork on his car, I admit it. Uh, you know him? Yes, and he knows me. He's my girlfriend's half-brother, she replied, sounding a little annoyed. He didn't mention me when you were talking about this forest. Well, he said there was a hedge witch living out here, and, well, he seemed to like talking about you like you were the Bigfoot, I told her hesitantly. She looked a little angry and a little hurt, but seemed to be making an effort to keep her composure. He's nearby, isn't he? She said, looking towards the forest. A sudden grimace swept across her face, and I knew that she knew that Jack and Alice were screwing. Elam, she commanded, hanging her head and clasping the bridge of her nose in frustration. The ghost didn't need any further instruction, immediately darting off into the woods. Seconds later, I heard both Jack and Alice screaming in terror. He's not hurting them. They'll be fine. They'll probably just write the whole thing off as a bad trip. Suddenly, she stood up and shouted. Those are entheogenic mushrooms, Jack. They're not for recreational use. She sat back down, looking exasperated, and I'd hurriedly reached for the cap that I had in my pocket and offered it to her. No, you're fine. Keep it. You might actually get some use out of it, she said. She then reached into her pocket and pulled out a business card. I won't keep you here any longer. I'm sure you want to catch up with your friends and make sure they're all right. But if you're interested in learning more about all of this, or in honing your clairvoyance... I work at Eve's Eden of Esoterica in Sombra Mori. We can schedule a remote session, or you can come to visit us after the lockdown's over. Genevieve and I will be more than happy to help you. Um, thank you, I said as I gently accepted the card. And thank you for saving me from the archway. Oh, don't mention it, and, uh, I mean that. Thinking and speaking of spirits does have a tendency to draw their attention, she smirked. Swallowing anxiously, I nodded graciously and ran off back towards the trail, taking care to avoid the arch as I did so. The cemetery became lost in the trees behind me far quicker than it logically should have. But I didn't forget it, though, or Samantha. 
Elam, the ghost, was kind enough to point me in the direction Jack and Alice had run off to. They were scared and stoned, but otherwise okay. I didn't tell them what had happened to me. I just scolded them for tripping on shrooms while out in the middle of the woods. Alex accepted that her encounter with Elam was just a bad trip pretty easily. But Samantha was telling the truth about Jack. He knows her. And he knows that was her spirit familiar, so hopefully he'll think twice before spreading urban legends about her again. I went online to see if I could find any more about her, and, well, oh, I've stumbled into something way bigger than just creepy goings-on in the woods. I need to know more. I have all of Samantha's contact information from the business card she gave me, and I'm going to try and keep in touch with her. I couldn't help but smile when I saw her last name was Sumner. A very fitting name for someone who can summon spirits and fend off the damned. Like I said at the beginning, sometimes a name says a lot about a person. The River Witch Ah, uh, people always come around to ask the same questions, wanting to understand something about the missing Shreveport girl. Some kind of fools always want a new angle, a new lead. But no matter how many times you tell people the story, that's all it remains to people. And it should be something more. But people are not listening for a warning, right? You want to know about her? They want to know about the River Witch, eh? Alright, if you feel you need to know, then I guess you need to know. It's a funny thing how knowing such things and believing such things don't always go hand in hand. Now, I'll tell you all I know and all I believe, but no matter what you end up thinking or believing, know that it won't change a thing. She's real. Damn real. Well, where to start this thing? Yeah, the dip. It was at the restaurant. That's where I first saw her. That's where she met the devil. The restaurant was just so in name, you see. Nothing more than a shanty open bar near the riverside where good old boys stop in for some good home-cooked meals. The place was always crowded with the trucks and boats on either side. Old lady by the name of Nina worked it with her two sons, Ray and Thomas. They called it the Midnight Dip. It was over in Southern Plaque Mines Parish. It was a happy place. Good food, good people, good times. Yeah, it had its share of fights or incidents, but nothing more than dumb drunks or angry wives looking for their men. <laughs> ah, good times. Well... Getting back to it, um, it happened in July, roughly two years ago. Madison, one of the new fellows working on the pipeline, he came by with his wife-to-be. Myra was her name. Nice girl. Come out of Shreveport, if I remember correctly. Well, she took sweet on Madison since he wasn't from around the local parts. He come from up north, Montana, you see. Anywho... When the pipeline was brought down through these parts, she left Shreveport and moved to New Orleans to be closer. She'd come down on every other weekend to spend time with him. A real sweet thing they had. Uh, it was what my mother would have called a glass romance, though. It wasn't long to last under any kind of pressure. Mm, the smell of barbecue was strong in the air that evening. The stars were shining sweet and the gumbo was just about done. Cold beers sit in the cooler. It was to be a good night. A normal night. Some of the boys were going to launch a few fireworks of their own on the far side of the riverbank. Going to be a hell of a show, I thought. <laughs> Drunk some fireworks, you know. Well, it was about nine or so. And the fresh catfish was just coming off the grill. We had a dartboard getting set up on the side of a tree. Went to throw the first round when I got a rude interruption. 
there was a woman's scream cutting over all the noise of the night. It scared the hell out of me, I'll tell you. It sounded something painful. And it turns out, it was. You see, that sweet girl Myra had gone to the truck to get something or other, and found the Madison fella getting real intimate with a local bush named Jesse. Well, it broke her heart on the spot. Poor thing. She ran right down onto the road, into the dark. Madison ran down after her, spouting a heap of lies about how his uh, carnal intentions with another woman wasn't what it seemed, <laughs> all the while struggling to get his pants back on. Soon he was lost into the darkness of the road, too. Madison came back around an hour later and got his truck. Didn't say anything, just got the truck and left. Well, another hour or so passes and he comes on down again to get a beer. Nina wouldn't serve him, because he took a nasty lip with her. Not that he needed it. I mean, the man came in smelling like race car fuel. He jumped in his truck and passed out before he even got the keys in. Which for the better, we thought. No need driving that drunk around here. Could end up in the river, dark waters. Nothing would find you there. Oh, nothing good, anyways. Around the tip of 1 a.m., Nina and her boy started getting the place cleaned up and ready for clothes. Lights were going off, and plates were going up. I remember finishing off my bit of beer and fish as we got ready to leave. Left my tip, got my stuff for the boat right home with my buddy Rand. As I walked outside, Saw something, saw something staggering just out of the corner of my eye down the road. Uh, it was a dirty, sloppy mess of rags. Damn thing looked like it had just walked right up out of the river. Mud and moss all over. As it got a bit closer, I saw it was that Myra girl. Ah, oh, what a nasty mess she was. I tell you, it was like she'd walked through mud, sewage, and a jungle all at once. Well, I ran over to her as best as a lickered-up old man could. I called out to Nina and Red. The two boys, Ray and Thomas, came first. They saw how she was and picked her up and brought her inside into the cabin. Nina brought out some warm towels and a clean blanket. Red and I just sat at the bar and watched, doing our best to stay out of the way. Yeah, I was damn near frozen from what they said. Took about a good twenty minutes or so, but they got her warmed up and covered. She wasn't saying a word at first, but Nina got her talking a little bit, and then a lot. A lot of it was cursing, mind you, mainly about that Madison fella. When she calmed down again, she told Nina something horrid. Oh, she started crying again, softer this time. She started telling Nina about how she was walking down the road. Madison came up on behind her, started to gag her and beat her. It's hard to make out through the tears, but well, I think she said that Jesse girl was with him. Yeah, she said that after the beating, Madison dragged her by the hair to some place cold and wet. Some place evil. She actually said the word evil. Well, back then I didn't know how you could tell that some place was evil, though we all learned fast soon enough. She said she couldn't remember more than that. After that she just broke down again, inside this time. You could just know it by looking at her. Oh, that poor thing just sat there looking like a half-drowned cat. I remember Nina was cussing up a bit under her breath now. She went on about how she never liked that Madison man, and that she should have buckshot his rear the moment he walked up to the dip. Oh, I hate to be the guy who gets in another man's life, but if the girl was telling the truth, then Madison was a real deal scumbag who broke a pretty girl. Anyway, Red came back in and told me he'd call Sheriff Hornings. We got up to tell Nina that Red and I were heading out as it was late and all, but as I got off the bar stool, I saw Myra get up too. 
Well, it caught me off guard as it was so quick. I tell you, that girl's legs didn't push her up. It, it was like she was yanked up off of the floor. She started walking out right away. Walking with a purpose. I called out to her and she paid no attention. She just kept walking. One of Nina's boys, Ray, taking sweet on the girl and trying to see what was going on. Well, she ignored him too. When he tried to hold her hand, he pulled it back quick like something burned or shocked him. He fell to the ground with a cry of pain as he cradled his hand. She opened the back door and sat outside in the tall grass by the riverbank. She just sat there and didn't move or say anything. Damn, it was just creepy. I remember we took a look at Ray's hand, and it was red hot. His mama was putting an ice pack on it while his brother helped. Red was looking over and said he saw bite marks on the hand. Nina put Ray's hand to the light and noticed that he sure did have two small bite marks on him. Nina checked it out, and sure enough, there was something on him. It kind of looked like a weird snake bite. Just the fangs were too far apart, and there seemed to be two sets of them. Ray started to run hot water all over, and said he felt sick. He said that his head was killing him. Thomas had asked me to get the first aid kit from the back of the bar. Well, I'd been there enough years to need it once or twice myself, so I knew my way around. As I poked on back behind the bar, I saw Myra, still sitting in the tall grass. She had her head tilted up, talking to someone. I couldn't see who, though. Well, I tossed the kid over to Red and stepped out back again. And that's... Oh, that's when I saw him. He was tall, a good eight foot on him at least. He stood there in the tall grass talking to Myra. I did my best to put him together in my eyes. It was almost like my mind couldn't keep him in direct sight. It was like looking at a moving ink spot. It was all dark and wispy-like. I tell you, I, yeah, I know it's hard to believe, yeah, considering the drinking, but I tell you... I knew that what I was looking at wasn't something men were supposed to see. Not rightly, anyways. It was a deep feeling. Something inside was telling me to get away, to close my eyes. I don't know if it was instincts or something else, but I could feel the danger, and maybe even the evil. As I watched Myra talking to the thing, it raised its arm, I think and wrapped her whole head in that same inky cloud, lifted her straight up. I thought it was choking her to death. I called out to her, at least I tried. You see, before I even opened my mouth, I was dropped to the mud with a brutal force. I couldn't move a muscle, couldn't even scream. I could hear the commotion inside the dip. Oh, they were helping young Ray with his arm. Nina was yelling, cursing, crying all the same time. Thomas was doing his best to help his brother and mother deal. From what I gathered, Ray had started going pale and cold. Red was yelling at me. He was asking me to come back inside. I wanted to say something, but it was useless. I was pinned down. But I don't rightly know what happened. But I was sure that the devil thing outside had somehow done it to me. I managed to move my head a bit, and then just a bit more. Little by little, I was able to move again. As I finally managed to stand, I looked for the girl and that thing. I was equal parts relieved and terrified to not see either of them. I stumbled my way back into the restaurant and stared at Red for a solid minute or so while he asked me what was wrong. I couldn't say a word. I didn't know how to begin. My own internal debates as to what to say were cut short by an ugly, grinding sound booming outside. Red went out back first, and he could hear them letting loose all sorts of curses. A horrible, 
deep wailing started to come from outside now. Thomas and Nina stayed focused on rain, but the screaming was getting to them. And this was a man scream, a terrified scream. Well, I thought it was red at first, but he came back in with a face as pale as poor Ray's. He gave me one deep look, and I knew that he'd seen the devil outside as I had. Well, don't know what made me do it. Maybe part stupid, or just curious. I took a few steps toward the door. Red looked at me with a look that was pleading me not to go outside. He may even have been saying it too couldn't tell. I opened the door and saw a damn horrible sight. You see, in all the commotion, we'd forgotten about that bastard Madison. He was still outside, passed out in the truck. When I saw him, though, he was wide up, sober and terrified. Myra had him. Now you can all judge and spit in my story, but I tell you, that's what I saw. It just still seemed so out of reach. Yet it was real. I know it. Myra was there with a nasty look in her eyes. It was a mix of a hungry gator and a scared deer. Well, that's the best I can describe it. Totally inhuman, really. She was still wearing the heavy blanket that Nina had draped over her. With one arm on the grill of the truck, and feet digging into the mud, she was pulling Madison towards the river. Madison was trying his damnedest to break the windows or open the doors, and nothing worked. That same black garbage that I saw earlier, it was swimming all over the truck. He screamed, he cussed, he cried like a little kid, and I could do nothing but watch. I knew that Madison was going to have something bad happen to him, no matter what I did. Well, I tell you, I looked at Myra, and she seemed to be dripping with that blackness all over. It was that devil stuff. It was coming out of her ears, her eyes, her mouth, and her nose. It was covering the truck with more and more. Oh, that little Myra, she pulled the whole truck from the lot to the river without breaking stride. Myra, whatever it was inside her, the devil, I say, it had to be. And when I stared at her too long, she started to break up in my eyes. Just the devil thing before me. She wasn't part of the world anymore. No, she was lost. I just knew that, somehow. She got to the edge of the river. She let go of the truck. His front wheels were already in the water. She stepped back to the side and screamed out some crazy noise. Oh, it hurt all over just to hear it. I can't help but imagine it's what being inside a microwave must feel like. My head and arms Legs, all of it, felt like they were about to pop and burn. It was over quickly, though. Then she fell to the floor and started puking up gallons of that evil black stuff. I heard Madison calling out, crying for help. He'd finally broken a piece of the windshield and got his foot stuck. God, it was like watching a rabbit dog in a kennel. Then I heard the wailing noise again. The blackness swirling around the truck stopped and seemed to pour to the ground like water. It was dark out, and the stuff itself was darker than anything. But I tell you, I watched it drain all to the river. Myra was still just sitting there, bent over by the riverbank. More and more of that stuff just kept coming out of her. God, it was coming out like a dam had broken inside of her. And the wailing noise came back for a moment, and then faded. We could hear Madison calling out to Myra to help him. He was going on about how much he loved her, oh, and how she needed him. How he could help her and comfort her. And if she heard him, she didn't show any reaction at all. 
There was a big splash in the river. Madison noticed it too. He stopped his noise and looked straight ahead. It felt like hours had gone by while we stared at that river. And then it came out. The thing that finally killed Madison. It was a hand. Massive, though. It seemed to be made out of twigs, logs, mud and rock. It was twice the size of the truck. Oh, I tell you, it was like the skeleton of the river. Damn crazy it was. It clawed its way to the shore, and I could make out a long, nasty arm of sorts trailing behind it. Well, Madison started to scream again, but not for long. The monstrosity of a hand reached the truck and grabbed it whole. I could see more of that black ink dripping from it. It happened so quickly, I couldn't even really believe what I was watching. It crushed the truck like a can. No way I could see Madison now. But I knew the man was dead. If he wasn't, then I hoped he'd die soon, just out of mercy. And the hand sank back into the river water as quickly as it had come. Myra was still there, bent over the riverbank. And I'm not ashamed to say that I went nowhere near her. I'd seen enough to know that whatever she was dealing with wasn't for God-fearing men to interfere with. I kept watching her, though. She didn't move one bit. I kept watching her, though. She didn't move one bit. She had a stillness that was just so unnatural. Nothing about her moved. Not even her hair. And just about that point, a strong wind was picking up. Now let me tell you, this was a whole other thing, this wind. Red was outside with me now. Didn't know how long he'd been at my side. I looked at him and saw he could tell this wind was something really bad, though. Really bad. A strange kind of bad. I could feel it. Not like a gust of cold wind across your face, but inside me. Oh, it was ugly, nasty stuff. It chilled me from the inside out. When it hit the river's edge, I saw it take form, or something like a form. I don't know exactly what it was I saw, but I felt like it watched me. These strange eyes kind of peering out from the dark. Yeah, I know it's hard to imagine, so it's even harder to talk about, but it was there, watching. Almost like a snake's eyes, I thought. It was just so hard to look at. It pulled more and more of that blackness to the river edge and started to suck it down into the water. Soon there was none of that stuff left on the muddy banks. As, whatever it was, started to pull itself to the waters, I saw Myra start to crack and crumble. Like dust in the wind. I'm telling you, it was surreal. It was nothing but a few seconds, and then she was gone. Nothing left of her. And then it was quiet again. No noise at all. Red damn near killed me when he put his hand on my back. My heart felt like it was stopping right there. I caught Thomas peeking through the back room windows to me. They both had the look that I must have been wearing. That look that says, we're not alone and we are afraid. I forced my legs to take me inside. Poor Nina. She sat there with her boy, Ray. I could tell by his face that he was gone. Glassy eyes and all. She cried about him for a good old while. Well, as any mother would. When the sheriff showed up, we had, well, we had nothing to tell him. We all just sat there staring at each other. Well, the sheriff, he knew something that was up, but... Left it as a lover's quarrel and left. He said that if Myra or Madison showed up, we were to bring them by the station. We all nodded. 
knowing well that we would never see that girl's face again. Or rather, we hoped we never would. He did his best to talk to Nina, but with her son dead on the floor, she had nothing to say. We told him he got a snake bite, or best we could tell. Harrison looked at us, and he could tell another story was sitting there, but he let it be. Red and I decided to walk home that night instead of taking the river. I myself have never been back on the water since. Can't even eat fish now, you know. Nina cried herself to death about a month after. Oh, poor lady just couldn't cope with any of it. Thomas still runs the dip, but nobody much goes there now. The whole area has kind of taken a negative dive. Since that night, other people have said that they've seen some really crazy things down on the river. I used to brush them off, but now, well, now I take notes. I know better than to ignore all the stories. And yet I also know well enough to leave them alone, too. As for that Jessie girl, no one has seen or heard from her since. She used to have a little place on the edge of the river. Well, it was not a surprise that no one can find the trailer anymore. Just a dirt lot where it used to be. Well, some say she moved. But being that close to the water, I just don't know. <sighs> I don't really have much else to tell you about that night. I recommend that you keep your mind open for what can be out there. Owen, oh, you try and get more out of my story than just a laugh at an old drunk. Farewell, friend. Remember, stay clear of the river. There are worse things than gators in those waters. Oh, one more thing. Pay the tab for me if you would. Uh, a couple of fantastic stories there, told round the campfire. Feels like I haven't done that for ages. Um, I'm kind of miss doing it, to be honest with you. Always creates an intriguing atmosphere to the stories. Well, we're starting off the new year in good fashion, I feel. Uh, more to come very soon. Um, well, <laughs> yeah, okay. So, uh, back again on Wednesday. Until then, my dear friends, very, very sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams, and bye-bye.